Welcome back, everybody. You got Will and I'm in here from the Block Runner Metazone, Roby and Mscrab, and today we're bringing you someone from uh, one of the leaders of Bit Dogs. His name is Sandman. Appreciate you for joining us, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Nice to have you on, dude. So we're going full on, full steam ahead into like the Runes ecosystem yeah. exploration, and um, and the thing is, it's crazy. Is like the, the protocol hasn't even really deployed yet. <laughs> yeah, but already we're 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 on the the bleeding edge of the cusp of like who's actually going down this rabbit hole and contributing and experimenting. And that's what led us to bit dogs, right? We did a whole video rundown of all these different projects and it's like, it's so hard to get like a, an over, like a, a scope yeah. of like all the things that are happening. Cause there's like too much. Happening. 20% of the projects that we could like, <laughs> like actually, put together. yeah. Yeah. But you guys, you get getting a lot of attention, a lot of hype. And then there's like some very interesting things, like there's zero XBT tie-ins with what you're doing. So yeah, we're really happy to have you on and um, kind of explain the origin of how this project began and like your motivations and strategy moving into Rune. So if you can, just give us like a quick background of yourself, uh, how you got involved, how this whole kind of project initiated in the beginning. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess um, in short, so I've been in crypto since approximately 2012. So I've been around quite a while. IRL, I work in the space. I run an innovation lab. We build blockchain and AI systems for quote unquote web two brands, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've been in the space for quite a while, uh, obviously with uh, more web three oriented communities, been very, very involved um, on a personal level as a collector and as a community member, mm -hmm. you know, across all the different ecosystems, Ethereum, Solana, Bitcoin, and the like. So um, you know, OXBT and the story behind that, I think is, is awesome, right? It's mm -hmm. a OG community, uh, very much ride or die. And, uh, you know, for me personally, it was kind of my entry point into, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem and ordinals and, and that whole, um, kind of evolution that's occurred over the last, let's call it 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in many respects, I think a lot of us who, who have really been around uh, for quite a while in this in this ecosystem, when I say quite a while, it's obviously just like less than two years or whatnot. But yeah, um, you know, it, it's really cool to kind of see how the how the community has evolved. Right. Mm -hmm. And so with the um, kind of nexus of rooms and, you know, all of the conversations that are happening around that right now, obviously it even uh, still to this day isn't even live yet right so we're all yeah. kind of anticipating and, and planning for you know what that cycle is going to look like um you know we felt like as a community it was really important and, and you know kind of a, a main value proposition frankly mm -hmm. uh in, in being able to transition all of the brc20 tokens and oxbt into rooms mm. and so we developed a strategy around how we would do that and which we can talk about a little bit further here but yeah, uh, that's a little bit of the backstory, and okay. um, there's about fifteen thousand wallets, um, so it's a pretty expansive base uh, within the OXBT community. Okay. And uh, I can tell you, yeah, certainly there's a lot of excitement and positivity heading into the mint next week. So yeah, uh, happy to jump into the strategy there around BitDog and all that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's very interesting. Just take us into like, um, I guess like a uh, and from your insider perspective, how, how the community kind of is like self-organizing, like how, how much of a percentage of these 15,000 people who acquired zero XPT, the BRC 20 token, which was launched basically probably like a year ago or maybe even a little longer. Right. Mm -hmm. It's one of the OG BRC 20 tokens. And that was led by BitGod, right? That he was the deployer of that token. And that's, he was the kind of one who was galvanizing that community and that, that force. I remember back in those days, David, mm -hmm. It was orange everything. Yeah, yeah. Everything. <laughs> he, he was yeah. kind of the leader of like just really pushing the orange pill around, you know. And um, so, yeah, in order for you guys to do this, it sounds like you have like an interesting technical transition ahead of you of like actually um, migrating a BRC20 token into the runes protocol, which I think is still kind of like up in the air how you yeah. can actually f technically achieve that, right? So. There's got to be a lot of discussions happening within your community, a lot of organizing. So how, how are you guys even managing that? Is it just purely through Discord? Um, yeah. is, are there any governance tools you guys are leveraging? Just kind of like walk us through that. Yeah, so um, so it all started, I guess. Um, so there's, there's about 30 people in total that are part of the contributing team. Mm -hmm. And at the helm of that is uh, both myself and another gentleman um, who goes by Skittles. And he's also kind of a longtime community member uh, across a lot of these different ecosystems that I've mentioned. 
And so, you know, in terms of how we organized, I would say it's largely based on, you know, discord organization um, mm -hmm. and, you know, just making sure that we have uh, good roles and responsibilities that are defined across mm -hmm. um, strategy, mark, you know, content communications, obviously um, the artwork that uh, speaks for itself. I think the artwork did, uh, was just an amazing job. AGZ, who was the artist for that, um, she, she really put a lot of um, love and passion into the bit dog art. And, um, and so as part of that, the vision I think was first, let's organize a little bit and start coming up with some roles uh, where people felt like they really wanted to contribute, right? And we knew that there was going to be a token. And so we kind of worked through some of the technicals of how we would, you know, kind of transition from a BRC20 to a rune. And so we can kind of set that aside for a moment and talk about it uh, maybe in a few minutes. But the other part of it that we felt um, was going to add quite a bit of value and excitement was uh, introducing art with it. Mm. And so having a, you know, kind of 10K PFP generative collection, if you will, that also uh, ends up mining runes mm -hmm. was something that we thought would be a great value proposition. You know, obviously with the age of user generated content mm -hmm. and, you know, the fact that people really like to identify and personalize with a brand, we really wanted to build a story and almost like an IP uh, around what the new rune token uh, would be mm -hmm. um, and, and really you know, mobilize that so that it was something more than just a coin, right? Um, because, of course, the marketing power that you see with any of these communities, I mean, take Doge as an example, um, a comparative over on Ethereum, that's also a community-run project, right? Yeah. And uh, a lot of that is based on the story and lore of the dog, right? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to build that out through um, BitDog, right? And so we built this whole story. It's actually a really cool video that uh, you can probably find on the Twitter account um, of BitDog, who's actually Shitoshi's dog, and they're kind of coming through this portal. And they land over here in Bitcoin. Mm. But of course, dogs like to like dig in the backyard, right? And so Bit Dog's digging in the backyard and he finds some runes. Mm. And that's essentially the lead point into uh, the fact that Bit Dog, uh, you know, kind of mines these runes, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, essentially the strategy that we'll have going forward with the token. Mm. And so doubling that almost like a hybrid, if you will, where there's a token, uh, right? The rune itself, which yeah. you know, just so we're clear, runes effectively are altcoins on Bitcoin. Correct. You know, it's very similar to an ERC-20 that you would see on Ethereum or an SPL token that you would see on Solana. Mm. And so um, you know, having a, a PFP that would go with that um, was something that we felt like would help build out that brand narrative and that IP. Mm. And something in the future that would, you know, really help us build out kind of a memetic culture, if you will, mm -hmm. um, around the new strategy for rooms. So, how do you tie, uh, I, I guess, a BRC fungible token to a POP project, and then finally back to runes? Like, how how does that all like get connected? Uh, yeah, well, the simple answer is you burn them all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, it's essentially what we're doing is um, we're doing the mint next week, which will. Um, you know, be for a hundred bucks, I think is the, the, the price point on that. Mm -hmm. And that mint will uh, essentially start the process, if you will, of the PFP. Yeah. And, and um, after the mint concludes, um, we'll be hosting a burn event. Okay. And that burn event is essentially a process where all of the OXBT will get burned. Mm -hmm. And based on, you know, whatever amounts you burn, you'll essentially get a, um, uh, an allocation, if you will, of the rooms, right? And so the way that we've kind of built that, we also built some cool gamification to it. Mm -hmm. So the bit dog itself will have a certain amount of rooms that are kind of tied to it, if you will. Um, there'll also be booster packs yeah. that we'll do that mm -hmm. are kind of uh, randomly generated. And so for um, a, a limited supply of people who burn, uh, uh, hopefully early in the process, you know, they're going to get potential boosters to that that will kind of couple with the existing runes that are tied to the bit dog itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then for those people that don't either mint the bit dog uh, or get a booster pack, and let's just say you guys had some OXPT sitting in your wallet, you didn't mint next week, uh, what do you do? Um, you essentially get to burn as well and, and get a, you know, a simple conversion, if you will, uh, of the runes. Which and so the idea <laughs> here is we'll kind of sunset the BRC20s Okay. And as people do that through the gamification of the burn, the burn event, we'll kind of migrate everybody onto the new standard. 
And just to be clear, like this is all tying into a singular token, right? The bit dogs and the eventually migrated OXBT token. Like uh, it's it's all part of the same ecosystem, or is, are they separate tokens? Like Big Dog has their own native token for the IP of that collection, and then OXBT is like a separate thing, or they're all kind of like you know converging into a singular uh, token. Yeah, from a, from a technical standpoint, they are separate. Okay. So. That's why we're doing the burn of the OXBT, which is the BRC20 token. Mm -hmm. And the runes token will be etched and uh, inscribed and then issued um, as part of a brand new kind of token, if you will. So it's the same community, of course, right? The people that have been around from the jump. Yeah. And, you know, and so we really were able to take advantage of that. And that's really the whole premise of all of this is like, how do we really drive a a really fun process as well as uh, hopefully some good value creation for folks that have been around a while. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We've been talking about this a lot lately. It's just as we're seeing a lot of this starting to spawn, right? Like um, with Node Monkeys and the pups, mm-hmm. obviously very popular ordinal collections, but like organically, these fungible token counterparts just kind of emerged without like even their permission or even like their knowledge, right? It's like, hey, uh, we didn't do this, guys. But just so you know, in case it is a pump and dump, right? There's a, like a $500 million pups token or yeah. node token out there. But it didn't come from us. But so now the big question is, how do you actually discover an interplay with fungible and non-fungible tokens and build like an actual ecosystem out of that? So what we were predicting is like, I think project founders are going to start take no- taking notice of that and be like, you know what? We need to kind of like incept these two asset classes at the same time, or at least find, fi- find that interplay at a much earlier stage. So there's a much more like cohesive understanding of like what this can do for the ecosystem as a whole, right? Um, do you guys kind of buy into that, like philosophy wise, like, cause I, I already see like a lot of advantages from what you're doing, you know, your, your, your community scope is now much broader than just four or 5,000, you know, non-fungible token holders. Like you can expand this in, to a pretty large pool of people, right? Yep. So from your perspective, what are the advantages of that? Like tying a non-fungible token community to a fungible token community, like what do you foresee, uh, the benefits for that? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. There's a certain amount of scalability that comes with it. Yeah. Uh, on one side, right? If you're looking at it from the from the perspective of the, you know, the ten thousand um, fungible or, or non fungible tokens, right? Mm-hmm. You're only ever uh, ten thousand, right? Yeah. Um, but as you scale that out with the rooms, um, there's definitely going to be more than ten thousand rooms. We'll we'll communicate uh, exactly the quantities and all of that, um, you know, pretty shortly here, but. Um, there's definitely going to be more than that. So it allows for the holder base to, to really grow out. Um, but on the flip side, if you're comparing it from the lens of a fungible token, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys have like Amazon stock or anything else like that, like you don't <laughs> see people PFPing that. Mm, right? Correct. And so at the end of the day, mm. that PFP creates a completely different behavioral dynamic mm-hmm. um, around, you know, the, the, the way that people really want to go out and brand around a community that they're involved in, right? Um, the ability to drive user-generated content, which ends up creating a marketing flywheel, yeah. um, you know, is very organic mm. and, again, scalable mm-hmm. um, and really start to benefit from some of the more, like, you know, mimetic culture, if you will, that you see with more traditional uh, fungible tokens. Yeah. And so from my POV, and, and, and a kind of center point of our strategy here was how do we take advantage of the best of both worlds, right? Where you have personalization and IP and brand lore and, um, you know, a storyline and that like that, that kind of um, push that you get from a, a PFP standpoint, right? Or an NFT standpoint. Um, but then also the scale and some of the uh, capabilities that you get from a fungible standpoint, right? right? In terms of the larger holder base, et cetera. Yeah. And so we put those two together. Um, we think it's a very powerful combination. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of folks that have done that yet. Uh, it doesn't really matter who's first, frankly. It's just yeah. you know, what matters most than anything is just like a good vision, yeah. a good founding team or core team that's really working on it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's fun that we're kind of um, out here uh, very early out of the gates, but there are going to be other people that, that do things like this, I certainly expect. A thousand you, percent, you yeah. Imperatives of this. Um, I don't know if you guys are following Ethereum much, but you kind of have those 404 standards. Mm-hmm. Hybrid uh, tokens, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then you also have like the hybrid SPL tokens over on Solana, mm-hmm. which allow you to kind of fractionalize, um, you know, uh, non-fungible tokens into fungible and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And so uh, 
Bitcoin certainly doesn't have that comparative, uh, at least yet. Um, but I think this will be, uh, in my personal perspective, probably one of the early cases of it that you'll see out there. Yeah. Did you know that we're more than just a YouTube channel? We also built Mscribe, the first inscription platform built from the ground up for the metaverse on Bitcoin. Connect your bitmap ordinals and use our tools to bring your community into the virtual realm. Support us by joining the movement at mscribe.io. Like, comment, and subscribe for the latest alpha. Back to the video. So how do you tie, um, like, do you have to have OXPT with, uh, with a bit dog in order to get runes or, um, are they like independent assets in terms of like how you extract runes, um, through this ecosystem? Like how, how does that, how does that work? Yeah. So, um, they are separate, right? So the first thing is, as I mentioned earlier, if you are an OXPT holder, and you you don't mint the bit dog for whatever reason right you're still going to have the ability to kind of burn some of that oxbt and get some runes right now for the folks that um did go out and support the big dog um kind of um, mint obviously next week um there's incentives for them to do that it's essentially larger uh, amounts of runes that you get when you when you do mint the bit dog and then as i mentioned the booster packs that you get um you know with the burn event which can only be used if you have a bit dog in your wallet one for one. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you have one bit dog, you can have one booster pack and you'll get a larger essentially bag, right. Mm -hmm. Of the runes mm -hmm. versus if you were to just um, turn in your OXPT, burn it and get some runes back. Right. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I wanted to create some gamification yeah. Uh, yeah. as well as obviously drive support for um, the launch of the PFP project itself. Is there any like randomization as far as like the runes, uh, is it like a flat expecta expectation as far as like how many runes gets accounted for a bit dog or is there some sort of rarity component to that in any way or it, it maybe like even like a timed mechanism like oh, I don't know is there any like staking mechanisms considered like you know locking up your bit I don't know you know how crazy these like uh, different rune distribution mechanics can get like what is yeah. the scope as far as like what you guys are thinking of yeah, so we wanted to keep it super simple, right? Yeah. Um, we are you know, obviously in a market right now that's got a lot of hype and excitement. And so I think there's a lot of stuff going on. And so the attention spans, we have to be very mindful of and not overcomplicating mm -hmm. things. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that's the first thing that we, was really at the top of our mind as we were building this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a standard amount that um, each dog gets. Mm -hmm. And so that amount, um, a... a larger tranche of that will essentially roll out very close to the time frame in which we do the mint. Obviously we've got the happening coming up, so we want to watch that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of speculation on what mean pool fees are going to be and, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. going on there. So we're going to have to kind of moderate, you know, really watch that, make sure we're being you know sound and prudent yeah. um, in terms of you know how we roll that out. But the strategy is going to be, um, let's get a, a big bag of those runes that are tied to the dog, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, uh, you know, available out front. Mm -hmm. And then it will be essentially a, a period which will follow over uh, essentially uh, different blocks. Mm. Uh, it actually lands at about 69 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and that yeah. will get, you know, kind of smaller tranches, if you will, of runes over time. Okay. And so we felt that would be good because, um, you know, certainly there'd be some uh, some tokens that would be out there for people to have um, and trade around with in the near term, uh, but then also create some incentives that kind of act like staking, but it's not like officially staking, right? Correct. The, the dogs yeah. themselves um, end up just mining them. So that's all, you know, programmatic into the inscription itself. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the end of each block, there's a period where uh, there's kind of a payday, if you will, mm. right? And so whoever owns... Um, that dog at that point in time gets that payday mm -hmm. and uh, it does end up hopefully driving um, you know, that kind of feeling where people want to hold this, you know, longer term yeah. and, and really support the project over time. Do you anticipate uh, Casey Rottermore uh, adding functionality to runes in the future, or do you think it's going to be pretty static in the same way that BRC 20 has been pretty static? Um, hard for me to speculate, honestly. Yeah, but if I uh, just use what I've uh, seen historically, I would imagine that there's going to continue to be a lot of work and innovation that happens in this space. Yeah, that's one of the things, frankly, that's um, so exciting for a guy like me, just like as a technologist and as a builder in the industry, 
is it, it gives me OG Ethereum vibes, right? Mm. Like, mm. you know, back when we didn't have all this sophistication and there weren't, you know, apps and, and solutions for every nook and cranny of uh, different product experiences that you might want to deliver, you know, uh, comparatively over on Bitcoin, it's still very raw, yeah, mm -hmm. right? And that's exciting, right? Because mm -hmm. I very much view technology as art in its own right. Mm -hmm. And and I think, um, you know, you're really able to demonstrate that in a really cool way over in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, but there's also an opportunity from my perspective to continue innovating. And there's a lot of white space out there. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure and tooling uh, surrounding rooms that uh, my own speculation would be that KC may or may not try to go build himself, but there's going to be other players out there. Yeah. They're going to go out and build, just like you saw on Ethereum, um, different components and infrastructures around um, the, yeah. this protocol, right? <laughs> and so I think in a nutshell, the focus in the near term was, hey, let's get a better standard forward, right? Um, there's a variety of different reasons why, from a technical standpoint, the runes are you know, theoretically better, they're lighter weight, you know, they're, you know, UTXO based. And, and so it, it just allows for a smoother transaction experience. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, certainly there's going to be a lot of infrastructure that's going to continue to evolve. Yeah. And uh, that's very exciting uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I think there's, there's a lot of cool stuff to do. Um, yeah. I, like I said, I spent a lot of time over on Solana and Ethereum. I'm like all in on Bitcoin at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Uh, I think we're in the same camp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of time on Ethereum also, but we, we missed the phase of Ethereum's like uh, maturation, uh, similar yeah. to where we are where we're with Bitcoin, right? We, we kind of came in when all the like major infrastructure primitives were kind of in place. So we could like really contribute and build pretty seamlessly. I feel like other yeah. than like the whole scalability thing, that's where we ran into our first like wall of like, oh shit, what we're building doesn't even, yeah, can't even operate anymore because it just it's too Ethereum. expensive. Yeah, so obviously we're gonna run into the same issues on on Bitcoin, but we're dealing with much core primitive concerns of like yeah functionality, like how do we do anything really like yeah. beyond just issuing tokens, right? So you're right, that's where we are. I have the same comp well confidence. I, I don't necessarily think like all other token protocols that precede Runes are going to like vaporize into uh, nothingness. <clears throat> I could be wrong. But I have the same expectation from Casey, meaning like he, he's already set like a precedent where he not just launched and deployed ordinals, but he spent a year kind of like refining it and, you know, making sure it becomes as robust as possible before he puts on that official declaration of like, you know, this is um, mm -hmm. this is mainnet operational. Right. It took till Jubilee to kind of like for him to have that 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 stance. Right. Yeah, whole year. And a lot of innovations kind of like happened throughout that whole year. So I'm, I'm anticipating basically the same thing for runes. It's going to come out kind of janky, kind of uh, lacking a lot of like robust uh, infrastructure components, but those things are going to fall in place over time. And he's going to be committed to kind of like incorporating that into the protocol, you know? So that's my expectation. Uh, projects like yourselves, and we're going to talk to many others into the future. I'm sure all of you guys are going to leverage every single little uh addition like as they roll out right just to strengthen your um you know your, your ecosystem because that's what you're building here right it's not just a, an art project anymore like you have a lot of people that are going to be participating in this in the growth of whatever it is you're building right and right now it, it might seem like a, a really cool vibing uh culture but a year from now you guys could be uh, like you're saying creating this whole ugc platform for the metaverse potentially who knows right, right? that's that's what we like to think of it like where, where can we take these pfp ecosystems and get them to produce some like some tangible multiplayer goods? activities <laughs> something right yeah. so at some point i think all this is going to spill into the metaverse space i'm not too sure how familiar you are with bitmaps and stuff like that and the metaverse on bitcoin narrative and such but mm -hmm. it's not so painfully obvious how all this is like has going to have some inevitable interplay with all of that um, i'm just curious if you guys have ever thought or explored at all like how you know what, what's happening in ordinals these new fungible tokens on runes how this is all going to interplay or interconnect with uh, the metaverse on bitcoin oh man yeah we could talk for a while on that <laughs> uh, yeah uh, i guess tldr i think the answer is absolutely right like yeah. there's as I mentioned, that's one of the really fun things about this is there's so much white space to, mm -hmm. to go out and innovate and build uh, different verticals, right? And, and I think at the core of that 
is, you know, different experiences around IP and brand development. And, you know, of course there's opportunities to bring that through on not only metaverse, but gaming and, Mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of IP, even film and music, et cetera. Right. And so I I think absolutely there's an opportunity to, to, to continue pushing and, and innovating in the space. And I think a lot of what we're seeing now is kind of that core level, you know, infrastructure, if you will, mm-hmm. that is being set up to enable that. Yeah. Um, I certainly expect there to be, um, I like to call them parallel networks, not L2s, mm. um, around Bitcoin that, you know, help drive efficiency around some of these different use cases as well. Of course, there are very technical limitations to, you know, the traditional L1 mainnet, um, you know, kind of use case, right? File size requirements, speed, cost. Uh, those sorts of things are going to, and especially post happening, are going to end up being a real issue, especially the, the cost component of that, right? Yeah. And so uh, I certainly believe that there's going to be a lot of evolution around some of these peripheral layers, if you will, mm-hmm. that are going to build around, um, you know, kind of the L1. And, you know, with that, I think you'll see, just like you saw on Ethereum, right? There are blockchains that really specialize in gaming and there are blockchains that really specialize in video infrastructure and there are blockchains that specialize in different use cases, right? Solana is really good at, you know, high speed, fast transactions. Yeah. And so uh, you should expect to see that same kind of evolution here. Um, We're just so early, man. Like literally, that's why I was like, this is like OG Ethereum vibes because there's just so much to go out and build. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you're starting to see a lot of the folks that have been involved with the Ethereum communities really start to want to get engaged here, myself included, right? I mean, I've been, as I mentioned, in in the space for quite a while, Um, kind of an old dog around here, no pun intended. But, um, you know, when I uh, really started learning about Bitcoin, I'll tell you the first thing uh, in Ordinals, uh, I immediately mid-curved it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I immediately faded it. Mm. And it was like, oh, there's no reason, all these reasons why that doesn't make sense. It's slow, it's expensive, you have, you know, infrastructure issues. Yeah. You know, it's not built for that, right? And, uh, but then I started like opening my mind, right? Mm. And I think that's one of the things that Web3 really focuses you to do. Yeah. And, um, and through all of that, I started realizing the brilliance in, you know, the provenance that you get from being on chain, right? And the different use cases that you can get. Um, that, that I I just think haven't really been tapped yet. Right. So it is very much the wild, wild west. Yeah. And I think real builders in the space, um, that's really what we show up for, right. It's not Uh to make money as much as it is to go and like build, right. And try new things. And so, uh, to me, this is the best opportunity in the entire, you know, blockchain ecosystem agnostic of chain to be able to do that today. And, uh, and of course the community around it and the market cap and all of these things that you see in like the God chain, right. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, those are all just like factors that make this a very exciting conversation and narrative. Yeah. Uh, the community's here for it, right? Like it's funny to me, not funny, I guess, but it's just, it's interesting to note, you know, if you're in a Ethereum or Solana project, um, there's always a conversation of utility, right? Yeah. What do you get? And what's the utility and all these things, right? All the expectations are so much different. And then you come over to, to ordinals. And of course, people like the idea of you know, utility and tech and all of that. But uh, very much so, I would say what is prevalent and, and really the driving force is the community and the vibes. Mm-hmm. And I know yeah. it sounds somewhat like cliche, but do not underestimate the power of community. Mm. Because that is what drives this virality. That is what drives, um, you know, the user generated content and the marketing power yeah. that frankly, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of paid media in a traditional web two sense would not be able to deliver. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, I worked in the space, um, IRL. And so what I can tell you, um, you know, when you talk about advertising and those sorts of things is, you know, we, we are inundated with ads and promotions Mm -hmm. and you're seeing this shift where people are um, more likely to respond to uh, essentially recommendations from their friends, their family members or whatever that is, what I'll call organic content from people that they respect versus paid or promotional content. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, 
I don't know if there's a banner on um, you know MSN's website, right? For a hotel, and it's ten dollars off. Like I'm probably not going to click on it. Right? Mm-hmm. But uh, if one of you guys was like, "Yo, um, go to this hotel in LA. It's awesome." I probably wouldn't even really look at price unless it was like crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I take your recommendation and go, mm-hmm. right? And so think about what that does for engagement and conversion and um, you know the, the power of the marketing engine. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's the real innovation that we've seen within Web3, mm. at least from a marketing standpoint. It, it really is a paradigm shift compared to what you see with traditional Web2 grants, which mm. is very top down, yeah. right? Go out and get the biggest audiences you can, do the paid media to get the impressions over. Yeah. And they're really playing the, the math game, right? What's that conversion funnel look like? Mm-hmm. Whereas here, it's very much from a bottoms up organic standpoint. So because a lot of these initiatives are grassroots, very much like Fit Dog, right? And, you know, the communities get together and everyone feels like they have skin in the game, right? Like they have a, a page in this book that they need to write. And so uh, for me, I think that's really a, a lesson that a lot of Web2 brands can, can really draw from. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Pudgy Penguins and what they mm-hmm. did with yep. Walmart. But oh, yeah. Go look at that post and all the engagements on Twitter that Walmart got yeah. when they announced the Pudgy Penguins thing and compare that to any other post Walmart's done in probably the three years preceding. Mm. And, and it, the lopsided amount of engagement and you know likes and conversations that were happening when that all was going down mm-hmm. um, i guarantee you uh, there were folks over at walmart that were taking note of that i mm-hmm. guarantee you that probably raised some eyebrows right interesting mm-hmm. uh, because there really is no amount of money that can buy authentic organic user engagement yeah right yeah. or community engagement not even really user engagement but uh, I think you guys get the gist of it. Yeah. There, there really is a powerful <laughs> marketing engine that can be formed through these community initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, an important insight because uh, I feel like that power of community is going to manifest in the 3D realm and with the metaverse. And I feel yeah. like they, the contributors there, the community, they're going to contribute big time in the metaverse because the metaverse is extremely expensive to build on your own. And um, like you see any of these like huge games like GTA is like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to build. Uh, but for the metaverse is different, right? It's going to require a community to, to build it out. Yeah. And um, so I feel like that insight is really going to manifest not just in, in like retweets and likes, but in actual creation. Yeah, I think it's important too, just for people who don't understand, like, what is the value of Web3? It's like, what are all these crypto degens just doing casino shit over there? Like, yeah. how is this any good for humanity at scale, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. even ourselves, we ask ourselves that question quite frequently sometimes because you can get disillusioned by, like, some of the, the, the just the oversaturation of <clears throat> what it feels like is just a, a mass... Uh, exploitation of that, right? Yeah. Not necessarily like people who are, are all about just aligning with some sort of community ethos or some vibe, whatever you want to call it. And um, it's all for, for some actual public good, right? Yeah, or the yeah. expectation of some sort of good for the public. Sometimes those are kind of hard to like really identify, right? But they do exist for sure. Pudgy Penguin is a really good example that you brought up. And it's like unlocking those is like really what the whole mission is about right it's like finding more uh case scenarios where you can galvanize large segments of of humanity into pockets of community and like actually produce some good right like a brand like that is is good for humans right it's 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 an enrichment towards other children right it's a brand just like you know anything disney has come up with some boardroom with 12 executives God knows where some sort of underground layer in hell <laughs> coming up with all these weird things that like kind of control the minds of the youth, right? That that is what Disney does. But now we can kind of like, you know, um, have control of that a little we'll bit. Leverage like people to actually be the ones who yeah. just kind of generate these new things that that navigate our our attention in our uh, our culture down the line, right? So that is very important. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's another glimmer of hope for like all of this, right? This is why we're doing it. Yeah. Right. Um, I guess, yeah. yeah last minute details, man. If, if you want to go into <clears throat> the bit dogs launch, which is coming up very soon. Um, I believe it's April 17th. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you yeah. want to kind of like, you know, um, tell the community as far as like details, 
uh, you know, whitelist phases, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the only thing is just like show up, be ready next week. Yeah. Mm. All the whitelist phases are, are uh, closed up. Um, we have a massive amount of excitement and, and folks that have kind of signed up to be a part of this. Uh, I think the whole ecosystem is really rallied. Um, it, largely because like so many of us, uh, you know, we're already holders, right? So there's a little different dynamic there, right? Because if this were a brand new project with brand new, you know, founders or whatever, um, now you've got to kind of sell like why you're here, right? Whereas uh, in this scenario, we're already, you know, in, in 15,000 wallets, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so the conversation's a little bit different in that respect. Um, for us, it was really about just, like I said, keeping it simple and making it really fun and getting people excited, uh, not only about the rooms, right? Which uh, obviously, as you guys know, is like, that's all the conversation, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. that's the only thing people are really talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've seen more people uh, go out and buy their like uh, umbral nodes or whatever, or, you know, they're out <laughs> yeah. there installing clients on their desktop, Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. which is great for the strength of the ecosystem. I mean, it's probably the biggest, I'd love to see that stat actually in terms of like, mm. Um, yeah, you know, the, the increase in nodes that are being operated on the network just over the last six months in anticipation of rooms. That's true. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, yeah, we're really in like uh, execution mode at this point, right? The art's done, uh, the, the launch pad, uh, I should say, shout out to the team over at Lion uh, who built the launch pad. Uh, it's super clean and um, you know, very smooth process. I've gone through it myself. And um, again, one of the community members um, from within our like kind of core group of contributors. It's a co-founder over there and they donated, um, you know, development time and resources and all that to get this bill. Uh, this really, I mean, we don't have paid marketing here, right? We don't have all these like um, things, right? This is so much of a like community driven process that um, you know, everyone's really just been donating their time and their effort and their passion in this. And, and again, people feel like they've got skin in the game. So for next week, uh, April 17th, I, I guess the only thing is like be on point and be there because mm. uh, there's a lot of people lined up. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, there's kind of two different pass or, or phases, I guess. There's an OG phase, which will be driven uh, predominantly for folks that uh, either are existing um, OXBT holders or um, Crown Studio holders. Uh, and I didn't mention earlier uh, Crown Studio, which is the production studio that did all the art. Mm. Uh, is essentially a kind of a, a, a web three collective of creators of mm. which I'm the president for. Okay. And okay. so crown studio uh, is essentially the group that built, um, you know, all the lore, the art, the marketing strategy, the framework for the project management. We kind of came in and brought uh, a, a lot of uh, process and structure. And then there were uh, folks that kind of raised their hands organically within um, you know, the OXPT community who also were artists, creators, et cetera, who joined forces with the folks over at Crown Studio. Um, and so, uh, and then obviously Lion and the folks over at, um, um, you know, the Launchpad. Mm -hmm. And so this has really been a microcosm of communities yeah. in so many different ways. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really fun to just kind of see how this thing unfolds. I'm super stoked for, for runes. Mm -hmm. I'm super stoked to kind of see how, you know, the meta start to shift uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, I'm super stoked to see a lot of these things that we've talked about today um, with, you know, broader use cases, you know, whether that's IP development or gaming or, or metaverses or, you know, the sky's the limit, really. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for next week, it's just like from my POV, that's when it all starts, not when it finishes. Like right now, it's just like a, a lot of time and you know, just focus on making sure we execute well, we're communicating well, um, and, and ready to go next next week on the seventeenth. All right. Well, that's awesome to hear, um, Sandman. I thank you so much for for watch or for joining us today and just like talking about Bit Dogs and mm -hmm. and what's going to happen on April seventeenth. I think this is going to uh, attract a lot of attention. Yeah, it's going to get the ball rolling. I think and like um, <clears throat> yeah. understanding. I think where yeah, the runes and ordinals cross section kind of meet yeah. right, which makes a lot of sense. Like we were expect anticipating this, but it's good to get like the insider knowledge of how do you actually like architect and put together this type of project that, that leverages all the, like the valuable components that I guess Casey has pretty much introduced to Bitcoin. <laughs> this yeah. is it. This, this is his baby. Yeah. And you guys are using it to its fullest extent. So yeah, we're excited to follow along. 
on your journey. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you would say like this is the optimization of like just ordinals and runes, yeah. right? Just yeah. PFP projects and fungible tokens. Like this is it. This that's it. Yeah. It's it's all on Bitcoin, right? So that's why all all eyes are on us, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, and I would say like it's just a start too, man. So yeah. like you look at how that's formed in this like I don't want to say hybrid, but kind of multifaceted strategy that you have with PFP, you know, with fungible and non fungible tokens. But what I'm super stoked for is like what you guys were talking about, which is like okay, well, what's that next thing? Like, what, yeah. what's post runes? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah we're already thinking about that. In yeah. innovation <laughs> space. Uh, it's always about where the hockey puck is going and you want to skate to that. Yeah. Uh, which was at the origin of why we wanted to to really be out there on the jump um, for runes. But my head is always uh, thinking a little bit further. So I'm, I'm I'm very much in the same camp of you guys in that like there's so much mm -hmm. to go out here and explore. Uh, and so many new things I think that we're gonna continue to see in this ecosystem. So yeah, man, I'm here for it. Really appreciate your guys' time today. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, anything uh, I can do, any questions or anything like that that, that show up post-mortem, just hit me up. Man. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sandman, thank you so much for, for joining us. Everyone else, the links will be in the description. Be on the lookout for April 17th. Appreciate you guys for watching, and we will catch you in the next video. Peace.